volumes that are targeted for and ahead of mining. Um, it de-risks mine planning and it provides critical geotechnical inputs. So uh, we're going to be focusing on platinum. Um, platinum is a pretty big commodity for South Africa, Southern Africa. Um, it's got a lot of different uses. I'm cognizant that I only have 15 minutes to get through this, so I'm not going to go into it, but it's used in everything. Uh, airbags, hearing aids, pacemakers, all sorts of things. Um, we've got about 80% of, of the world's platinum group metals share in South Africa. In South Africa. And about 40% of, of it is produced by uh, Amblats. Um, um, interestingly, all the platinum ever mined in the world would probably fit into this room. Hmm. So that's, so that's a, an interesting metric. metric. And, and it's, it's used, used between automotive industries, jewelry, jewelry and then a plethora of other applications. So I want to, so to touch on a, a an attribute um, for those that like seismics in the audience, Lindsay. Um, um, what, we're what we're doing here is looking at combining the plethora, the plethora of petrophysical geotechnical measurements that are made, even hydrogeophysical measurements that are made from within a borehole, and simplifying that into a single attribute or metric that can be used to guide geotechnical interventions in open cast as well as underground mining applications. So you can see here we've got a televiewer on the left. Uh, televiewers are essentially in borehole camera imaging devices. From that we can derive very specific, generally accurate, depending on how you use it, um, orientations for lithostructural features. That can, be that can be fabric, it can be fractures, it can be foliation. Can be foliation. Um, so, those um, so those orientations are in dip, dip direction. direction. Um, next, to that, next to that, we've got seismic, got seismic uh, measurements. measurements. So you get PNS wave velocity that's used for other engineering, engineering parameters. So we've derived things like Poisson, Shear, Young, Bolt, Moduli from that. There's uh, fracture frequencies of QD, which is similar. Uh, UCS, which is also derived from a, an equation that integrates seismic velocity. We then classify, we then classify different structural, different structural orientations, orientations or groups of different features that are in particular structural orientation band or classes. And look at how those interact with each other, because it's not just the orientation of a structure, it's how they interact with other structures that impacts the geotechnical uh, considerations. There's a joint intersection rating, which is part of that, and then all of that is rolled up into this hazard index on the right-hand side. So we've spoken about all of those sorts of things. Um, in this particular instance, we've got a thick dike, um, a fault and a shear. So if we jump into this plot, on the right-hand side, you'll see... So here's a little laser pointer. Um, on the right-hand side here, we've integrated the radiogram into this. So this is a cover hole that's drilled from surface quite a few hundred meters. We've got the integrated hazard index attribute here, showing areas of higher hazard. Um, Televiewer, in this case, a combined optical and acoustic tool, and the radar on the right-hand side. And I've attributed or annotated that plot on the right-hand side, showing the dike contact. You can see on the right-hand side here, we've got a lithological log. And in, and brown, in brown, there's an iron-rich iron alteration. alteration. So it's essentially a norite, but it's been altered. And one can, one can see in this radar gram how you sort of lose texture. So you can see these finer reflections in the radar gram in this area. Um, here, you're here in this iron-rich iron alteration. And because of the elevated electrical conductivity of the rock mass, it's absorbing the radar energy. So that attenuation is quite rapid. And, and that is plotted in distance or in time um, away, um, away from the borehole. You can see as we get out of this iron rich alteration product, we start to get this radar character and reflectivity returning to the radiogram. Um, and you can see, you know, quite discrete zones here where it's entirely washed out. Um, not necessarily visible at this scale, but there are um, some of these parameters that contribute to this higher hazard index at the base here. Not, not uh, as I say, visible in the acoustic televiewer at this scale. So that's one way that radar can be used. Um, something else that we derived from the study is comparison with laboratory measurements. 
So the, so the logs, logs that you can see, the sort of squiggly, squiggly logs, logs are the wireline logs from borehole. the borehole. And it's being, and it's being compared, compared to laboratory samples. So you can see here in the various colors. And the bar, and the bar plots, we've got laboratory, got laboratory analyses of density, density UCS, UCS, elastic moduli, all the, heading the headings you can see at the top. Um, <laughs> There's a, couple of, There's a couple of points here. So the dynamic so moduli are calculated, are calculated from the elastic wave velocity and density. Um, we're differentiating here between dynamic and static elastic moduli. So the static elastic moduli are those that would be derived from deformational studies in a laboratory. You take the rock and you break it. You deform it, you strain it to the point where it actually fails. And the, and the difference between these is the strain amplitude. So you've got, a, so you've got a, about 105 times somewhere in, somewhere in that order. Uh, difference in strain amplitude. So when you pass so a seismic signal through the rock mass, it perturbs, perturbs so ever so infinitesimally. Uh, when you break, uh, when you break it in a lab, obviously there's a lot more deformation. So these are, so these are approximations to what is done in the laboratory. In some cases, you can see here the laboratory measurements are significantly lower. Uh, indicating, uh, indicating a lower competence, competence. Um, um, and, that and that could be related to, to damage, damage or deformation during the, during the drilling process, process. Uh, during, uh, the during the extraction, during the extraction process. process. You're now taking that sample outside, outside of its original, original confining pressure. pressure. So, so those measurements are not true to the in-situ uh, character of the rock mass necessarily. So something, so something we face that's very real is uh, community-related issues, and often there's some pushback. You know, we, it's our job to, to change the perception of mining. It's not necessarily a dirty industry, and it does, as we all know, power by everything that goes on in our world. Um, so the bush belt is, we all know the bush belt, I'm not going to give you a background introduction. Bush belt, but there's potholes, there's faults, there's dikes, there's all sorts of engineering challenges to underground operations. And, and uh, a, lot of a lot of geophysical methods are applicable to platinum, in particular, in particular exploration of the bush belt. We can use airborne methods. methods. Um, um, they have, they have limitations, limitations in terms of resolution with depth. depth. We've used seismic, seismic really successfully, uh, successfully in the bush belt to pull in, in that high resolution at depth. But, but those, methods those methods generally require surface access, and surface, and surface access, access can be a problem. Be a problem. So, the, so these methods can be deployed from underground where you can avoid that surface access uh, restriction. So I'm going to show you radar as it's deployed in cover holes from underground in the Bushveld complex. Uh, challenges that we're facing is pressurized gas. Um, it is becoming more and more of a problem as the pressures increase, as the depth increases. It has resulted in fatalities and other serious injuries in the Bushbelt complex. Um, it can be organic or inorganic, structurally controlled, um, or actually origenic, so captured at the time that the Bushbelt formed. Um, various mitigating strategies are involved in the actual execution of mining underground related to these high pressure gas situations and generally involve preconditioning. So what is done in the mining operations is when a face is going to be um, mined, they would draw blast holes. But in many instances, they're drilling blast hole or a few holes in that panel ahead of the blast hole array. And those and are pre-blasted, pre not, not sufficiently to critically, critically damage the face, but it does, but it allow, does allow a significant relaxation of that stress of environment. environment. It changes it the, the strain rates, rates, essentially. So in, so in this borehole, it was a particular platinum mine. Um, methane, was methane was intersected with the collar. They could see it bubbling out of the, of the liquid. And the question was asked, can we detect the conduits for these methane emissions? And this is what the radiogram looked like. So here, so here um, I've marked at, at or on the borehole log the, the two, depths two depths at which the methane uh, emanated, uh, emanated from. And, and I think there's a few annotations here. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, the um, so the black arrows represent <laughs> chromatite seams in the bush belt. This top, this top seam here, here, you can see those reflections, are, are that seems, seems about one meter wide. So you get a so reflection, get a reflection near from contact near contact as well as, well as, as the far contact, contact to give you an idea of the resolution that's achieved with the 250 megahertz system. In black here, we've got those chromatite seams being imaged, and we've just put a directional filter on the data to highlight the brittle fractures in white. There's also a little parabolic feature here. Um, that's generally 
from very localized disruptions. So it's it's a an artifact in the data which eventually gets processed out. Um, some of you may be familiar with this site. It's Gwas Rafir out in the eastern Bushveld. These are the chromatide seams we're talking about. These are quite thin stringers. Um, and if I bring your attention to these structures that are dipping relative to those chromatide seams, those are probably the orientation of the structures that we are imaging. So here, we so here we've done some FK filtering just to separate waves that are dipping in different directions. You can see this leg of the brittle features comes out quite nicely in this image. The other leg is emphasized or the other one de-emphasized as you change the direction of that filter. Um, Borhol radar has some limitations. There's a bit of ambiguity in terms of the direction that the reflectivity originates from. It's sort of a, a cylindrical measurement, not quite the same as a surface GPR that has a directional antenna. So when you think of the reflectivity, it's not just a line, but it's probably a cone or a cylinder and some solid solution between those. I'm about to get the chicken. Um, so if, so we, if project we project that section, that section let's make the assumption that all the geology is flat lying, we project the section up and down, and we can, and we can deliver some sort of lithological and structural model from that. As I said, some ambiguity, so hence the question marks, because those structures could also be those structures. So one does need some a priori control. Um, just shooting the radar in a blind environment is probably not going to deliver the results that you're wanting. So, so here we've got the radar section projected in this instance above the borehole in 3D. I've added, I've added now the downgoing um, radiogram and we can pop on a one to the right hand side as well. I'm just going to skip over that slide. So here's the three radiograms up down to the right. I've colored them. Uh, we've just drawn on two rough interpretations. So that's the same feature, but now interpreted in two different planes. And the, and the implication is that we know that, we know that, we know that one's geology, we know it's pretty flat lying. The structures, the structures however, we don't know if they're dipping to the, in this case, the north, or whether they're sub vertical structures like this that are steeply dipping. Um, however, we can remove that ambiguity with the adoption of televiewers, for example. Here's some ground truth. Geophysicists often don't like talking about truth, but here it is. Um, we pulled up the boreholes, we looked at the deformation at those particular depths. So here you can see it zoomed in at the bottom of the slide. That's a little 10 centimeter scale. So that's about a half a meter of brittle deformation. Um, doesn't seem to be any significant manifestation visually of alteration uh, along that structure, but that's where it is. Um, here, again, we've got a little scale bar, that's still 10 centimeters. So this breakage here is only 10 centimeters wide, and we're getting reflectivity from it probably 20 to 25 meters from the ball in a homogenous NORAC background. So pretty significant. Um, here we can demonstrate that there's sort of a workflow. You can go from a geological surface through to a forward model radar section. So you can understand the complexity and what you might image in a synthetic environment. You can then get the actual radar results. Um, you might be able to add some interpretations and then take that back into your structural model to evolve it. Um, so improving, so improving the success rates. rates. Oh, sorry, the animation was a bit silly there. I'm going to jump over to the cost or the alternative, or the alternative and, the commercial, and the commercial impact. So data from a long time ago, 2007, um, by someone, someone that actually used to work in CSR. And uh, we looked at costs there, and you're looking at, let's not focus on the cost per point, but the total cost of three boreholes at that stage was super cheap, 137,000 rand, and borehole radar in those boreholes, 86,000 rand. Current drilling costs, you're probably looking at closer to 300 to 1,000 rand per meter, um, with contemporary costs being about one-sixth of the cost of drilling. And then, and then the final application, the application looking at radar applied, applied in the underground the environment, but now immediately, immediately ahead of mine. So, so in that last panel. Uh, again, uh, again I'll take you back to the, the Dwarf's Dwarf Review sites. sites. And now we're not looking, we're not looking at those, but we're looking at that little feature under there. So these very, very thin chromatite stringers. They're mechanically, they're mechanically quite friable, uh, and, they uh, and they end up being a, a detachment horizon. In, in many of the mines hanging walls. So, so fall of ground, of ground is a very real issue. We're not talking, We're not talking about drilling like this. We're talking about drilling that looks more like this.
Uh, many, uh, many of the mines have these mechanized drilling machines, machines that can achieve nice sub-parallel sub -parallel and consistent uh, blast, uh, blast holes in each, each successive panel. panel. So what, so what we're doing is essentially akin to collision avoidance, so looking, so looking ahead of mining, looking into, looking into the hanging wall that is not, that is not yet hanging, as opposed, as opposed to, to a, traditional a traditional method, which is inspecting a hanging wall that <laughs> is now above your head, and, and often unsupported because all of the geotechnical support that's introduced critically compromises the ability of radar to image these things. So this is what it would look like. You've got the biostatic radar tool where there's a transmitter and a receiver, separate. Um, it's like whack-a-mole, like whack you can sort of stick it in any of the, the holes in the blast space and come up with different combinations, different common midpoints for that permutation. And you can image these stringers in, in the hanging wall. There's a variable move out depending on the distance that that reflector is from the transmitter and receiver. And if you do this enough across enough blast holes in the face and across subsequent faces as the mine advances, you can start to build up a 3D representation of what these, these horizons might look like and then look for anomalies in that. Next. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, we looked at parameters, the hazard index, um, a little, bit, a little ahead bit ahead of mining in cover holes, as well as immediately ahead of mining in all the ground. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.